So I remembered back to what that guy had said, the scary guy telling us how to deal with all this. And he said, just spray it with insect repellent um, because then it detaches. If you try and take it off yourself, it can be quite painful. Mm. Just do that. What he didn't say is what insect repellent actually does to a leech, which is make it explode. <laughs> and so I sprayed it and it exploded like a Tarantino gunshot and just went... <laughs> Hello there. My name is Kit Rackley, my pronouns are they, them, and this is Coffee and Geography. The aim of the show is to get to know, explore, and celebrate the diverse and intersectional range of people on this rock we call home, and their love and passions of it. We'll find out why guests identify as geographers, and if they don't exactly, we'll have fun exploring all the myriad of ways that connects their life to geography. So, pour your favourite brew, get cosy and listen in. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe and follow us on Twitter at CoffeeJogPot. Off we go. Hi everybody and welcome back to the Coffee and Geography podcast. I am joined by the punk biologist, Lucy Eckersley. Hello, Lucy. Hello, it's lovely to be here. And I have to, Lucy, before we start, I've got to get this off my chest, right? And I did mention this to you in a Twitter feed. I just, your hair is just stunning. Okay. I'm like goals, like seriously. I, I love that that on a podcast, you're like, that thing about the way you look is the best thing. I'm like, oh, no. So yeah, I, for <laughs> listeners, if you haven't seen me on Twitter or anything like that, I have like very, very bright red hair have done for quite a number of years now it's gone from pink to like an orangey and now it's bright red um and it's quite sweet because it appears to be a really good way uh people are learning how to socialize and talk to each other again because the amount of people who come up to me on the street and they'll be like can I just say I really like your hair and I'm like oh well well done yeah thank you thank you <laughs> you did a talking um, to someone <laughs> Yeah, um, I know. I, I know it might have been cringe to some people, but seriously, I mean, I have I have a different. I come at it from a different angle. Is the fact it's not just like you know it looks great. It also is like goals for me because uh... I I love because I am trying to grow my hair out naturally. And when I was wearing hair pieces, I actually had almost the same similar style. So the bangs and then slightly past the shoulders, and it was kind of brownish red, quite quite deep red, but brownish red. And then, yeah, so it's just like, I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, that just looks amazing. That's what I'm going to go for. And I do actually need to re-dye my hair back to red again to this evening because I'm going back on to campus tomorrow. <gasps> my God. So, I know. Amazing. Um, but, but yeah, yeah, you're right. We talked about this just before, didn't we, about the social anxiety and just, yeah. But anyway, yeah. Kit, stop stop waffling now. That's, <laughs> this is why I call myself Jog Ramblings because I do ramble sometimes. Um <laughs> rather than the hiking thing. Right, so Lucy, you are a wildlife biologist by training and you use uh, your knowledge to talk to young people interested in careers in veterinary and animal sciences. And Lucy is also a presenter and stand-up comic, focusing on stories of field work gone wrong. And I'm not going to let you come onto this show and get away with that. And as, a, as an ex-high school teacher, geography teacher, we're going to trade stories later. Okay, so cool. So we'll come back to that. I'm going to, th- there'll be some I have to keep in the bank for my stand-up shows, uh, because if everyone hears it and then they'll see me and be like, oh, you're just repeating this again. No, because that's my funniest one. But I've definitely got one written down that I can I can definitely trade with you. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I, f- I feel quite privileged in that respect then. But, <laughs> um, but not just the fact that you were going to share one with me, but the fact that you you uh, have confidence in my abilities that I actually make this show popular somehow. Yeah. <laughs> so people can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So yeah, we'll, we'll trade tragedies a little bit later then. Um, <laughs> first, let's talk about what you're, what you're drinking then, because you know we're mapping our brev- beverages to demonstrate just one example of interconnectivity around the world. So Lucy, what brew do you have in front of you? Oh, that is a very good question, and particularly as a northerner. So I, I don't know if this is completely against the rules, but I've got I've got two. <laughs> no, it's not against the rules. Okay, cool. Go for it. So uh, number one, which is my uh, thing that I drink probably, I, I have about three in the morning before I can start being a human, because um, I'm from North Manchester. It's just it's just a requirement, and that is Yorkshire tea. Um, Snap. 
Yes, it's it's the best tea. Um, and it's just, I feel like, particularly working from home, now the fact that I am three paces away from my kettle has meant that my tea consumption has <laughs> skyrocketed. But I feel like it's just imbuing me with more northern power. Uh, I really, really enjoy it. And so Yorkshire tea is my number one. Um, and then my second one, which is slightly more ridiculous, uh, I do have to say, uh, is kombucha. Because kombucha. it's my, I'm, I live in Camden now. This is my Camden tea, <laughs> uh, my hipster tea. Uh, so this is one of the Remedy uh, brand and it's the Raspberry Lemony Kombucha. And I literally picked it up because I read somewhere, it was like, oh, it's tea. Oh, for some reason, I thought kombucha was, I thought it was like kefir or something. I thought it was yogurt tea. It's like, oh my God, it's tea. I will like it. Um, and tried it and then immediately did the same face as the kombucha meme girl um, of going like, oh God, oh no, actually it's really good. And it's amazing. So would massively recommend. And it's um, got like probiotic uh, properties because it's fermented. So it's really good for you. So that means it's okay for me to drink loads of it. <laughs> uh it's fine. I was so anything that didn't come in a tea bag, you know, like our classic Yorkshire tea that we're, we're, you know, that's it. That's it. Yorkshire tea. Now that's the third time you've been mentioned on this podcast. That's it. You are sponsoring us now, right? I'll yes. get in touch. <laughs> um, and um, the, I had the same experience with, uh, with, cause I'm like, no, I lipped to nice tea when I used to be in the States a lot. No, that, no, thank you. And all that kind of stuff. But then I went to San Francisco um, and I actually lived in an RV in someone's garden for two months while I was on placement there. And they Amazing. grew their own, um, they grew their own ve veg and fruits and they made their own kombucha. Um, so they left me a bottle of kombucha on the RV step every few days to just to keep me replenished which was absolutely lovely i was like what is this what is this what is this and when the host described it to me and said the word tea you know it was that whole that that thing you know where the camera pans on your face but everything falls away like oh, no but i have to say i had the same experience you did i was like this is actually quite good really and now i good, have isn't it? yeah and now i i will get high quality kombucha brilliant but nothing will ever will ever beat that home brewed don't worry everybody i'm not converting too too far from the classic black tea <laughs> oh yeah yeah i mean yorkshire tea is the main the main staple of my diet <laughs> so what yes. i consume the most of um to the point where it's like I, so i have uh chronic pain issues i have chronic migraines and i um mostly medicate with tea because there's not much else you can do with chronic migraines you have to avoid triggers and caffeine isn't one for me so i'm like bring on the tea <laughs> as much of it as i possibly can <laughs> wonderful so uh the map that we're talking about where we're plotting all these brews you know listeners can find that interactive map on the coffee and geography podcast website at jogramblings.com now any of my geog uh, geography teacher colleagues out there willing to work with me to produce some educational materials from it uh give me a shout because um and this, and I, I want this i'm using this as a promotional thing but also as a segue for you um we've mapped so far, we've mapped the primary producers, which are the growers, to Kenya, Sri Lanka, Sumatra, Southeast Brazil, Northeast India, and the Azores, which was given to us by Joanna Mendes last um, episode, the only place in Europe where they tea grow tea. Wow. Now, you've traveled a fair bit, Lucy. Have you yes. traveled to any of those places? Do you want me to list them again? <laughs> so I think, uh, so Kenya was in there, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And so um, I've been to Kenya, specifically to Nairobi and then into the Masai Mara a couple of times now, specifically because my very good friend, Emily Madsen, who is a wildlife biologist, still working in that area of doing academia and conservation work. Um, and I'm in teaching people about that now so I went out there to assist her with her work but also video some of it and it was pretty amazing and I really did enjoy learning about particularly in the Maasai Mara the different conflicts that are going on there with the Maasai people and how uh, science can help make sure that their views are being listened to because in the past that may not have been something that was happening um, and so yeah Kenya I don't think I've been to any of the others I keep being invited to the Azores which sounds like like why would you not go but it's to go and do works so. <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah um so i've been i've only been to kenya in transit um i was actually meant to go to kenya with the university of Stanglia during my um second or third year to do some uh studying out there but um 
there was a terrorist in, you mentioned conflicts and there was some kind of terrorist incident that year it was 2000 i think it was 2003 um and they so we couldn't but what we did do we we went to south africa instead so um and we so we flew into nairobi then onto onto johannesburg and then we did some work uh, just outside and inside of Kruger National Park, so oh, wow. which was incredibly amazing. Mm. And I've also had the privilege of of going to Malawi as well on a teacher exchange. So, uh, yeah, they're the only two places I've been to in that brilliant, lovely, beautiful, diverse continent of Africa. And uh, yeah, it never never ceases to amaze me whenever I, I go there. And um, and as you you've just listed in a very very succinct <laughs> way, all those different aspects of that you can enjoy study you know and look at when you're in a place in that small little corner of Africa and as you can guess Lucy is an ex-geography high school teacher Africa is not a country it's a continent (laughs) yeah so yeah and it's it's a it's something that I think um, I've seen a number of different podcasts and people just kind of highlighting this recently particularly in the last year or so when it's been um you'll have seen on Twitter, anybody who's part of particularly biodiversity uh, or biological groups, um, lots of things like um, Black Birders Week or various other uh, initiatives that are making sure that particularly people who live within certain countries are actually having a say in what happens, um, which, oh, shocker. Yeah, shock. <laughs> Brand new idea of things that should be happening. Um, but yeah, it's it's been really, really exciting over the last year to be able to see ple- people being given a platform to do conservation and all of the related um, topics in the country that they know the, v- the most about. <laughs> so it's been really, really cool. Yeah, we could talk about that as a topic for, for hours on end, you know, gotcha. you know especially because the other thing that I've been a part of quite a fair bit is is the decolonizing of the, the curriculum um, with a bunch of geography educators as well. Uh, and yeah, and and our our WhatsApp chat is completely saturated, not not because people are taking too much of the platform over, but just simply there's just so much to talk about, so much to do, so much to think about. And yeah, and you know we talk a lot about, um, for example, indigenous populations and the conservation of land and how the national park systems, when they're not done responsibly, they are a method of colonization. And yeah. so, yeah, we could go off on that on, on absolutely forever. <laughs> I have, um, I have many thoughts on that. <laughs> yes, yes. Perhaps we'll have to have you back again another day. Um, so let's let's stick with place then. So you're currently in Camden. You're from Manchester. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're not right. Your nearest tube stop is not on the Northern Line, is it? It is. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Right. Yeah. Anybody, right. Anybody who is listening to this episode after episode is now becoming an inside joke, right? <laughs> So, so you think I think you are the third person, maybe the fourth person. I've no, the fourth person I think I've had along the Northern Line itself. So, yeah, you're just going to have to listen back to. I'll fill it's, you in after. It but, is the best tube line, though. You've got you get handed your flat cap and you whip it when you step on. You have your pie. Uh, no, it's the best tube line I think because it just you know it it doesn't mess around. It takes you right down the middle. Which side do you want to go on? Sorted. Some of the other yep. ones do mess around quite a bit. Yeah. Well, uh, my my, my uh, jaunt was the central line. I'm originally from Arlo in Essex, and I used to get on at Epping and go down via the central line. But uh, yeah, it's it's funny. It's so fun. And honestly, listeners, honestly, I did not plan this. This is completely, <laughs> completely coincidental that, what, you're my 11th guest now. Um, God knows how I've managed this many so far. But And you're the fourth person, I think, on the Northern Line. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. It's right. where all the cool so, people are. Absolutely. Yeah, quite <laughs> clearly. Um I feel drawn to you for some reason. Uh, <laughs> so you're in Camden. You're from Manchester, as you already said. You've been to all these wonderful, amazing places around the world. Um, and we had a little chat actually about about your your partner as well, which is amazing. You've got all these excellent, wonderful kind of uh, mishmash of places that you've been to and you've experienced. Um, and Japan as well, you told yes. me. So tell me, how has this all um morphed changed formed your identity how has all these places kind of fed into who you are right now so very 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 interesting question something that like I've been pondering about recently because obviously with uh lockdowns and with being responsible over the last year I hadn't seen my family for quite a long time uh so my parents when I moved to Japan which I'll talk about in a minute my parents actually um rented out their house got a motorhome and went traveling around northern Europe 
mountainous areas, so the Alps uh, kind of regions, and then into Spain. And that really clearly changed their perspective on the world and life and people, which was really, really cool. They're retired, so they were able to do that, which is excellent opportunity for them. Um, particularly after my mum worked in the NHS for a long time. <laughs> so it's like, get, go on, go on a big long holiday. Um, and well yeah, they're, they're back in Manchester now, but I hadn't been able to see them for a long time. I didn't go up there for Christmas, uh, which was quite strange. And so going back to Manchester, I was like, it's weird because it really does feel like it's a very important part of who I am. Um, but I also was discussing it with a friend. I don't really feel like being... Uh, English or British is an important part of my identity. I am, and I am aware of um, the privileges that it affords me in various different ways, um, being, you know, English speaking and various other things. Um, but being Mancunian <laughs> is more what I am. Um, and not in a kind of, a lot of people will say, oh, w- well, which team then? And I'm like, oh, I actually don't care about football. <laughs> I do not care because one parent supports City, one ter- parent supports United, so I stay out of it. Uh, do not care. <laughs> I like other sports, not football. It just caused problems. But Manchester has, in general, quite a um, open and friendly atmosphere. Particularly when I go back there from living in London. Uh, it when we first went up with my partner, who is from London, I was talking to somebody in I think Boots, chatting to them, saying I've been living in London. And after we went, he was like, "Did you um, did you know her?" And I was like, "No." Like you just you just talk to people. It's Manchester. Like, come on. Um, there's a lot of you, people have probably already heard the uh, phrases that come out of Manchester. The you know, this is Manchester. We do things differently here, and it's just a little bit of like, you know, come on, sod off with all of your ridiculous ideas of how people should be. Be friendly, help yeah. each other, care for each other, and build a community in whatever way that is. Independent music amazing stuff that goes on so I'm really I really love Manchester Um, I left at 18 to go and work in Japan through uh, the Japanese Red Cross so I worked in a hospital in Nagasaki which obviously the vast majority of people who know Nagasaki know it through historical um, events that have happened and I lived about 200 foot away from the hypercenter of the bomb which meant that I lived very, very close to areas that had signs that were like, this was where the ground level was prior to the bomb and it would be two stories up. And I also live very close to Memorial Park and the Memorial Museum. And I worked at the hospital where there were people there who were telling me stories about what happened um, because they were of that age, the age. Population in Japan, they live for a really long time. Uh, yeah, so yeah. quite a few people tell me stories. And the fact that I was living there and everything that people knew about Nagasaki in comparison to what people's ideas are of Japan, Japan people go like, oh my God, is it like so random and like Pikachu everywhere? And is it like all fish? Um, which Yes, it is all fish, <laughs> but the rest of it, it's not really. Um, but when you say Nagasaki, people have a very, very different, they're like, oh my God what what's there is that always it is now you know it's a incredible industrial area it's a port um because it is on a peninsula and so it's surrounded by mountains and um has an estuary in the middle which is a really important shipping area for nagasaki uh, for japan in general and the island that nagasaki is on um but also it's got some really interesting other historical bits because part of the area was taken over by the dutch so there's an area called hustenbosch that looks literally like somebody nicked a bit of of um, Europe and put it in Japan. Hmm. It's so bizarre. You're like Japanese yeah. style. Oh my God, what's that? <laughs> um, really, really cool area. So living there and living in a place where, I don't know why I even thought people might speak English. Why would they? It's Japan, Lucy. Why on earth would they be talking in English? <laughs> um, uh, learning a new language and also learning how to be respectful in a culture that is extremely different to my own and therefore I need to be very aware that things that I seem seem think of as normal are not um that really really altered my perspective of how I come across in particular um because my god I'm loud in comparison to a lot of (laughs) Japanese people um 
And then, yeah, I moved back to England. I went to Sheffield University, which has its own historical, interesting things, um, particularly the women of steel kind of idea of the women who started working in the steel factories. I actually have a flick knife tattoo across my ribs with women of steel in memory of my time in, in Sheffield. Then now I live in Camden. <laughs> <laughs> and it's quite funny because people will be like, where do you live? Looking at me. And then I'll go, Camden. And they're like, oh, of course. Of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like anime hair, Doc Martens, leather jacket, piercings, like, yep, yep, Camden, that checks out. Um, so it is quite amusing. I didn't mean to live here. I just did my master's here and then never left. <laughs> but yeah. What an incredible story. Yeah, that's really, really amazing. And um, there is so much geography in there. Where mm. where, where would we start? Um, one, one thing that also kind of really does inform your identity as well is you say here that you spend a lot of time in the outdoors you've been photographing birds actually you were out for a walk earlier today and you post that lovely um chif chaff picture on did, twitter indeed. yeah and uh, you love to learn about the processes that make the landscape especially how it impacts by biodiversity okay now you said that you're gonna you like communicating this in educational stuff so i'm gonna go and try and work in a planned disruption because a couple of episodes ago there was uh my youngest gate crashed a, ah. my chat with geography teacher helen young um you know we were talking earlier about avengers before before we recorded and um yeah he's an avengers nut and he was making crashing banging noises iron man poof, hulk smash and all that kind of stuff while i was trying to record but anyway <laughs> so this time i'm gonna give my eldest a chance so um Let's bring in my eldest. My eldest is actually already known in the geography teacher community because you've actually been a part of a of a teach me, haven't you? Yes, I have. Right. So this is this is Theo. Everybody, say hi. I'll, I'll put this in your ear so you can hear Lucy. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi, Theo. What I'm going to do, Theo, I'm going to show you a video of of Lucy, right? And I want you to have a little listen. I know you love this kind of stuff, but I want you to then tell Lucy what you thought with the video. Are you ready? And then I'll tell everybody what it is. So this is Lucy here. So if you look at this screen, and Lucy will know which one I am doing, which is the one titled CBBC Expert Presenter Search Submission. Right, you ready? Hey guys, I'm Punk Biologist, and I am obsessed with nature, from skulls to creepy crawlies. See, when I was a kid, I saw a TV show where a cheetah got on a car and did a poo through the sunroof onto the presenter. And I thought, I want that job. I'm so excited. <laughs> I can tell. Since then, I've been traveling the world from Camden to the Maasai Mara. And getting stuck in, in my own kind of way. Ah! See, nature is a Right. So, what do you think of that then, Theo? Well, I liked it because. As a as one of the kid geographers, um, <laughs> which is um, which is a group called Mini Geographers, I came up with that name. Nice. <laughs> so, um, and I am really into geography. When I was back there, I was writing a story about the Great Fire of London, and that is geography and history, which is two um, bits of of geography because um, history and climate change and lots of other subjects are part of geography and when I was over there I heard you and dad talking about you traveling in the world and that's super cool I would like to do that when I grew, oh. grew up oh I'm sure you will and it's really really it's very mature thought of the fact that you've said all of those subjects kind of interconnect. You're right. You learn them maybe separate at school, but they all play a part in each other. And most of history is dictated by geography. And that's really, really cool. Yeah, that's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. This is completely unscripted, everybody. <laughs> Theo had complete free reign to say what they wanted. Right, Theo, the next thing that me and Lucy are going to talk about is something that you really, 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 really love, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, you like watching cartoons, don't you? Yes. You like watching anime cartoons, so does Lucy, yes. right? So you've been watching, um, you've finished the whole of Avatar, The Last Airbender, haven't you? Yes. Um, you've watched a bit of She-Ra, which is for obvious reasons I love too. I want you to tell Lucy, what is your favourite Studio Ghibli movie? Um, Ponyo. You like Ponyo? Yeah. Ponyo, that is a very, very good one. I think that's a 
that's definitely up there. I think my favorite, have you seen Princess Mononoke? Yeah, that one's my favorite, but that's because I like animals and there's loads of animals in that one. Yes, um, particularly, I like wolves and there are great big wolves in it, so it's brilliant. <laughs> It, and it's also my second favourite movie. Oh, yes. Yeah, you've got excellent taste then, Thea. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. it's not surprising that it would be one of the ones with the environmental message is one yeah. of your favourites. <laughs> Absolutely. Theo, thank you so much for being a superstar. Once again, just like in that Teach Me, you've stolen the show, I think. <laughs> so thank you very much. It was very cool to meet you, Theo. Bye. Bye. <laughs> oh, bless you. Right, you go back to writing your novel. Literally, that is really what they're doing. They are writing a story of, yeah, so there you go. That's, oh, that actually went, I'm a bit relieved. That went well. <laughs> that was extraordinary. And yeah, the the fact that they know already that the subjects that they may be being taught very, very separately, because they are taught kind of in isolation, particularly um, when you get into secondary school. I know they're not there yet, but they start to become like, this is your biology. This is your geography. Um, oh my goodness! But yes. they're so interconnected, and it—it's a real shame that it's not talked about more. Because then you can start to think about, okay, well, how does politics influence biodiversity? It does massively. So yeah, that's a really, really cool mindset that they've got at such a young age. I don't try to, or my wife and I don't try to to press that on. I mean, naturally, as an educator myself, I will take every single opportunity, as probably you do, I'll take every single opportunity to say, I mean, well, actually, you do know, because you've done it so eloquently and lovely so far in this podcast, like you went on that lovely kind of thing about the Nagasaki area. And it was like, I was like, I didn't know half of that stuff. That's amazing. So yeah, you know, the feeling of taking every single opportunity. And that's really what we've done. So freezing things in blocks of ice to try and teach about glaciation and stuff like that. So that's pretty cool. I like that. (laughs) Yeah, well, it was this this one's um, self discovery. Um, we did um, a play thing called Imps. Shout out to uh, Rachel Baker. Hi, Rachel. Hope you're doing okay. Um, where it's like this kind of exploratory thing where where you just go around and you just play with stuff. So so she'll set up um, skittles with on a on a rocking pendulum. So you've got to try and not you know things like that, and then all paints and then things like that. And one of the things she did was have blocks of ice with food coloring in a pipette. So what you warm food coloring so you just drip it in that and actually i noticed when Theo was playing with that i said hang on a minute moulons are being created you know because puddles of meltwater are sitting on and then it's actually drilling holes through the ice and i was like oh my god i was like it's a shame i'm not a teacher anymore so i would have done that now (laughs) so but yeah and then so this one knows how glaciers glaciers milk can it be accelerated from that process just for simple exploitation exploitation that's not even a word exploration (laughs) You want to say something? Else? Oh, okay, everybody, oh. We're, we're back. Come on in. Uh oh, that's it. It's right. Okay, you're going to be the new host now. But it's I don't, the Theo I don't podcast have any more. Now. Yeah, I don't have any more um, cookies to pay you with though. I know. Right. Okay. Here's here's Lucy again. Right. Go on in. I'll just hold it here for you. Um, all that Daddy was saying um, when about the glacier things and the um and the pipettes that um, they actually melted the ice that that drilled through um the holes um that drilled to make the holes in the ice just like glaciers and that was from on my um sixth birthday um, oh, um when we went to rachel's house and she had a, a little party um like a mini imps session yeah that sounds so cool that's an amazing thing to be doing by your sixth birthday that's really really awesome you're nearly seven right yeah yeah i'll say happy birthday early from me that's really really oh. cool oh that's right well well remember because because um, Rachel couldn't do imps as normal because of coronavirus, so she set up a, an outdoor imps in her garden in her house, and then had people families come over one at a time. Oh, That's brilliant. right. And then we went over for your for your sixth birthday. Yeah, I forgot about that. That's, it was a nice, Good lovely memory. sunny day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got better memory than me, you know. Oh, right, amazing. off you pop then. Thank you. <laughs> oh my goodness, me! You're enjoying this way too much. I don't know where you get it from, Theo. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Ah, oh, right. Um, okay, moving on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you you do you do a bit of um, stand up comedy, and particularly one of the things you like talking about is uh, field trips gone wrong. So right, yes. okay, 
<laughs> Field trips gone wrong. Who's going to go first here? Would you like to go first or shall I go first? So I've, I've got kind of two in my head. One, which is just, they're both just amusing because when you do ones that are like, oh, this is like a serious issue, people are like, oh, okay. Um, it's not necessarily <laughs> the, the main thing you want to bring up, um, but the no. two funny ones. And I can start with one from Kenya, um, okay. if that's all right. Yeah. So... This was the second time I'd been out with my friend in Kenya and she spends her time driving around in a fantastic Land Rover that breaks quite a lot. Um, We actually managed to once, the fan belt broke and we managed to just be literally outside the mechanics. It was like the nearest mechanics for about 40 miles, probably even longer. And we were like, oh my God, we're literally right outside the mechanics. And it's just one building next to the Predator Hub. Um, So yeah, that was quite amusing. But we were mostly working from her base, which was in an area called Talek. But then we needed to go up to the Mara Triangle, which is further away, and do some work up there. So we went camping. We took a two-man tent that was just one of those like kind of little ones, comes up to about your waist if you stood up next to it. Uh, we had all of our stuff in there. And we went out in the morning. After hearing some lionesses when we woke up, I was like, what is that noise? She was on her iPad and she was like, oh, it's lions. I was like, what? (laughs) So what? We've got like nylon between us and it's lions. Um, We went out. We had actually had um, some drinks the night before with another group of researchers. Uh, So we were a little groggy and we did actually end up getting um we had two buffalo run run at us through the long grass Uh um which really really woke us up that was great um (laughs) so completely awake after that we hid behind the car um and then after a full day of checking the camera traps we came back via the researchers tent that we'd been at the night before and they were like are you guys all right your um your tent looks really really flat we were like I don't know what you mean. Oh, do you mean like, because it's short, it's small, because they're all in full safari tents that are up on stilts and they're like enormous. Um, we were like, oh no, it's just it's just a short tent. And they're like, no, I, it looked it looked flat. We we're like, okay, well, we didn't leave it flat. We go back and find out that what had happened is that uh, baboons like to use things like that as trampolines and they had <laughs> jumped on the top of it and just crushed the tent completely. So everything was flat. Um, and it was just a little bit like, okay, thankfully we made friends with the researchers. Please, can we stay in your tent? Because <laughs> ours is ruined. Uh, not something that we had prepared for. And it's such a shame we didn't put a camera trap up outside our tent. Uh, we obviously didn't because, you know, if you go out in the night for like a wee, you don't want a camera trap in there. <laughs> Um, but it's such a shame we didn't because that would have been hilarious. But that that was probably one of the more just funny uh, occurrences at the time. Obviously, sometimes working out in fields, particularly in areas where there are big predators, it can be quite dangerous. But that one was just amusing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. <laughs> I've just got this picture now of these baboons just jumping on top of your tent. <laughs> oh, good. Right. My one. So I... My one is a lot closer to home. So I used to teach in a high school just outside of Norwich. And of course, we did uh, your geography field trips every <clears throat> every year, which was great. So for GCSE field work and whatnot. And one year we decided to go to Fetford Forest, which was great. Fantastic. Because there was a lot of things we could we could do. We could look at the, the management of the land, how it may conflict or not with tourism, how it might be synergetic with tourism. Well, it comes all good. And we had this elaborate plan laid out because... Um, The way we used to run field work at our school is that we used to have the kids lead it. So the Saturday before I went out with a group of um, student volunteers and I taught them all the techniques they to use, you know, all the the sampling techniques and how all the equipment works, stuff like that. And then talked about logistics of the day, where the drop off points was going to be, how to work the GPS um, Garmin stuff, etc. So it was all great. It's like, this is fantastic. Came to the day before and it was the uh, the look to the forecast. I was like, "Uh oh, this isn't too great. But there was a chance, chance of isolated thunderstorms. And now, of course, nine times out of 10, fine. You know, it will hit the next town, village along, and you'll miss it completely. So I'm like, well, we're going to go, we're going to go. And we had already been in massive conflict about when we were going to go out with the other teachers anyway. So I was loath to reschedule. So off we go. We pull onto the A11. We had just can see Fetford Forest coming into the distance. All of a sudden, there was this big flash and a, li- and a lightning bolt in the distance struck the forest. I was like, this isn't great. This, in fact, maybe it will, 
we keep going though. Maybe it will clear by the time we get there. Maybe it will clear. Get into the forest. All of a sudden, there's this massive bang because a, a lightning bolt had struck a tree we were passing by as we were driving. Past. Oh my god! <laughs> so it's like, and then other kids are actually screaming. You know, it's like it's almost like the bus was toppling over because of the amount of screaming, which obviously it wasn't. But so then we pulled into the. Um, we, we were going to be linking up with, with the forestry commission. And so I pulled it to the office. The kids are like, so we just want to go back. We just want to go back. I rang the deputy head and I said, this is the situation. It is clearing up. We got advice from the forestry commission to say, what do you reckon is safe is not safe. So we had to change the entire itinerary of the trip, despite all of that. So we did do it, but the kids were soaking wet. Oh. Plenty of my trainers are ruined. Good. Cause I never said you should wear trainers anyway. Um, and, <laughs> And yeah, and the but it was worth it because there was this one moment which was brilliant. And I'm going to name this kid because he's he's above the age, you know, he's over 80 now. So it doesn't matter if I mention his name, Harrison. Harrison, you are a diamond, right? Because what Harrison did, he we we were trying to measure the turbidity of the water. I can't remember what the the thing is called now. We dropped it in off of a bridge into the into the river, and then it fell off its string and went bloop straight. Harrison decided to wade out into the middle of the river. <laughs> you could see the point where the water rushed into his welly boots. He retrieved the instrument, though, came back, but he, he absolutely loved it. He said oh. he loved the trip. So, I mean, um, that sounds Harrison, great, yeah. Yeah, so that was my fieldwork disaster. But, um, yeah, do you, uh, you want to you say your second or are you going to save it for? Uh, so I'll, the, like... I'll I'll tell you about it um, kind of more vaguely than uh, okay just between us yeah. in in my comedy sets it does come up because it is just minorly ridiculous. Essentially, <laughs> I was doing some field work out in Borneo. This was during my undergrad, and um, we before going into the rainforest in Borneo, uh, so we were in Malaysian Borneo, the northern-ish part of the air, uh, of the island. We were in Kota Kinabalu for a little while and we had a discussion with somebody who's telling us all about how to survive in the rainforest Um, because there's a lot of dangerous stuff there. And it was really, it was like, let's scare them. Um, It was saying things like, oh, you know, there are all of these like spiders, there are all of these snakes. Uh, There is this tree that if you were allergic to it and you walk past it, you'll get a rash. And it's like, okay. (laughs) Um, And then he'd say things like, and there are there are elephants and they stampede. Um, so obviously you don't want to get get in the way of one of those. But don't yeah, worry because that hasn't happened. Yeah, <laughs> don't worry that hasn't happened since like August. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> um, and so he was a little bit terrifying. And then we arrived in the camp um, after an extremely long and very very bumpy drive uh, because there's it's just roads in um, Malaysian Borneo. There's no trains or anything like that. So it's all ro- um, flight into the world's smallest airport, Lahad Datu, um, or at least is the world's smallest that I've been at at that time. And it was ridiculous because they were just like going, ah, you'll be fine. Like no baggage checks. Just be like, ah, go ahead. You'll be all right. Because it was just a little <laughs> wooden hut. Um, got into the camp. We did some really excellent work out in the field. We had a lot of quite amusing oh my God, look at that amazing hornbill. Let's spend half an hour taking photos of it. And then you turn around and there's like 80 of them. <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. Um, we're walking along. It is extraordinarily hot. It's like 38 degrees, something ridiculous. Um, 100% humidity because it's the rainforest. And you're clambering over buttress roots the whole time. And so your comfort level your your expectations massively drop you're just like i'm just going to be in pain for a bit i'm going to be sweating i'm going to feel gross i'm going to be in pain you're constantly covered in bits of fly that has flown onto you and stuck there and you just you know you get stuff on your hands and everything and i was like oh i feel a bit something feels a bit weird and i checked on the kind of just underneath my elbow um and just for a if you're not particularly into mentioning of blood um maybe skip on like three or four minutes um but i had a leech stuck to the inside of my arm just above my elbow um and it had been there for a while because it was massive and so i remembered back to what that guy had said the scary guy telling us how to deal with all this and he said just spray it with insect repellent um because then it detaches if you try and take it off yourself it can be quite painful just do that what he didn't say is what insect repellent actually does to a leech which is make it explode and (laughs) so i sprayed it and it exploded like a tarantino gunshot and just went (laughs) 
all over me. That oh, no. that situation actually escalated even worse. I ended up falling into an ant nest that was a fire oh. ant nest uh, and therefore got covered in these fire ants, was brushing them off me and then wiping my own blood all over myself. Oh my goodness. Uh, I ripped a load of my clothes as well uh, because I was stuck on the, these roots. And so by the time I got back to the camp, I was literally whip clothes, blood everywhere, <laughs> bits of leech all over me. And they were like, oh my God, what happened? And I was like, there was a leech. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, that was probably one of my more ridiculous ones, just because everyone found it highly amusing. Um, and that time out in Borneo was extraordinary because yeah, the the ecosystem out there is amazing um, and yeah. so so diverse. So it was a real privilege to be out there. Wow! Oh, Lucy, that's amazing. You brought. <laughs> so, I was just about to ask you, Lucy, what 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 movie was that from? Because it's like that that could so be like one of those comedy horror movies. Like oh, oh god, I love yeah. it yeah my oh my goodness um right oh how do we move on from that now usually i'm looking at the time now usually i would start wrapping this up but but a i'm having so much fun b we're gonna give some allowance for the little geographer this the self-proclaimed mini geographer uh, <laughs> so i will i will go on with this other feature and i'm gar i guarantee that i don't think anyone's going to be switching off now and getting fatigued on this so we are going to do this so we're going to do something uh, called jog on and jog on is where i give you five topics one after the other and you either say jog on if you want to talk about it or take a hike if you don't but here's here's the catch you can only say jog on to three of them so if you use your jog ons too early and like i give you the last topic that you can't talk about you might be oh i could have done it whatever so choose wisely okay. okay and these these are completely random i use a random topic generator to bring these up oh god um, yeah and so <laughs> i i there is this is not planned and just to confirm just to confirm lucy you have not seen the topics in advance i have not seen the topics in advance <laughs> and i'm only mildly worried <laughs> <laughs> okay right so the first topic and again jog on if you want to talk about it take a hike if you don't so the first one is is tennis um oh Jog on because okay. I've had thoughts recently, but also uh, I'm rubbish at it. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> that's something. So yes, that one. Okay, so let's so give us um, give us uh, sixty seconds to your thoughts on tennis then. Uh, so I'm rubbish at it. I played almost every sport you can think of growing up. I think my parents were like, "You're a bit weird. Please go and do some sport." And like. <laughs> you know, become slightly more sociable. Um, and I, so I did uh, rugby, windsurfing, kickboxing for years. Uh, and I did do a bit of tennis and I am awful, absolutely <laughs> point blank awful. I hate it. And so I was just the ball girl for my parents and my sister who were all amazing at tennis. Of course they are. Oh, um, and I like doing that because then I could just read at the side of the court and just catch the ball. But there's been some really interesting things coming out recently with Naomi um, Osaka. And yes. she has been talking about the fact that uh, she's been taking her mental health into consideration and therefore not wanting to do post-match interviews. And uh, there's been a lot of discussions about whether that is in the spirit of sport. And my idea is, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is, uh, because what we're watching, what I hope the vast majority of people who watch a sport are watching it for is the sport, not the post-match interview. Most of the time, I barely remember them. And also, didn't we have a whole era of Andy Murray being the world's grumpiest person in those? So it's <laughs> yes. clearly not. It's not a reflection of how good of a sports person they are. Um, but also, particularly, it's 2021, surely a mental health reason for not wanting to do something and somebody saying I'm doing this to protect my own mental health is good enough and yeah it was just making me quite frustrated but I, d yeah. I don't tend to follow things uh, the only other tennis take I have is that Serena Williams is amazing <laughs> yeah. yes but you touched on an exceptionally important point and thank you for bringing that up because um, I'm I'm mental health first aid trained and I take mental health very very seriously and I'm very open with my mental health and I really am pleased with how things have progressed and you just see you know, with Naomi Osaka's kind of the thing that's going on, and I'm not going to mention certain celebrity names, but there's oh, there's that one that just won't go away who commented on it, and and just awful, awful about you know 
how things are so draconian in certain aspects in certain things and and we just need to move on and we just need to say look i don't feel up to it right now can i and they're like yep fine no problem give us a call if you feel up to it if you don't we'll talk to you next time exactly Job done. making accommodations for people so that they feel yeah. like it's less pressure that would be a first step as well and um, but yeah i'm a mental health first aider as well because i also am working in a sector where mental health is really really important veterinary um, there is a yeah. mental health crisis within veterinary professionals because of the things that they have to deal with and uh, because also sometimes the way that people treat veterinary professionals because sometimes people see them as um, a bit like money grabbing which is a bit random mm. but it's because we're not used to in the UK paying for healthcare so when you pay for your animal's healthcare it's like oh my god where is why is that it's so expensive so yeah, that's that, that, like it's not going to the vet most of that the vast no. majority of it isn't going to the vet and they've trained to do this because they love animals and they want to help animals um i'm not a vet myself but i work very closely with them and prospective mm. vets and yeah so i think it's really important that people are you know taking accountability of mental health issues that arise uh, within their sector and looking at how we can make accommodations to make sure everyone feels welcome um, and that is clearly not happening in tennis at the moment. Yeah, well, that's a fantastic tangent, and and as I said, great, great that we have we got that aired. Um, now the next the next topic you probably might want to say jog on, although you've got two out of four to choose from. So the actual second topic, believe it or not, is donkeys. Donkeys. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Donkeys are something I might not have. Like out of all of the animals in the world that I have many many things to say about donkeys, I love them, but I think they might have to take a hike. Okay, right. I know, right? So, Which is a shock for a wildlife biologist. God, I hope the rest aren't really hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're just random, literally. Um, yeah, so the third topic is farmer's markets. Interesting. Okay, I'll say jog on to that. Go for um, it. So my take on farmer's markets is... I started to love them when I was a teenager because we, um, so in general, we started to look at fancier stuff when I was a teenager and my parents got quite into environmentalism. They are extremely into environmentalism now. They take a lot of time out of their retired lives to uh, to volunteer at local parks and uh, pantries and various other things and work with the council to um, to look after the environment in our in our little town in North Manchester, which hasn't had much of that in the past. but So it wasn't there. We were going to farmer's markets. It's not that kind of town. We'd go up to near the Pennines and there'd be places there. But one thing that I, my, my thoughts about it now, I think that it's an extraordinary place for small independent businesses to get their products out there. But what I hope doesn't happen is greenwashing, where people yes. are like, because it's from a farmer's market, this is better for the environment, for animals, for whatever it is. Because sometimes I think that that is, it's not, it's not a lazy approach to being more environmentally friendly, but it's a uh, insidious approach by certain mm. companies. And so if you are just selling things and your people are buying them under the guise of them being greener or being more local, and actually they have a different impact in the environment or the same, but it's just not written on the packaging. Um, I think that that could be a real issue. And as we know, businesses and organizations will take advantage of everything. And so I wouldn't be surprised if yeah. there are like, you know, the same things that are sold to Sainsbury's are also sold to people yeah. at farmers markets. <laughs> well, we're we're recording this in Pride Month, and I don't need to say any more than that. So, um, yeah, but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we we got we got a, quite a decent farmers market here in our in our market town, and um, we might like also go into the farm shop where my youngest goes to nursery, and they, literally everything, almost everything they have is really is local. Like the honey is like from the farm across the road the eggs oh, are their nice. eggs and so yeah you're absolutely right it's 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 the same as when you go shopping it we've all got pretty good at checking the labels and everything like that just carry on that process when you go to your farmer's market ask them where did it come from you know is it your family business all those all those questions it's like yeah. they love to talk to you the, the the ones who are there for genuine reasons love to talk to you about the source of their products and stuff love they it. do so because right, it's their life yeah yeah and one funny thing about farmers markets when we started to go when i was a teenager um my we went to one reasonably close by in the pennines and uh my dad was picking up some sausages 
I never really ate sausages at all. I was vegetarian at the time, I think. Um, and so I was like, I won't be having them. And this person started talking about the sausages and about how they keep the pigs and what the welfare conditions are like. And then said, and this will have been from Clive, the pig. <laughs> and my dad had already bought them at this point. But then he was like, I can't, I can't eat them. They're from Clive, the pig. And I was like, I mean, <laughs> if that's enough of a reason for you not to eat the sausages, maybe, maybe expand that but um <laughs> but it was just quite an amusing thing because then they were in the freezer for a while he's like i can't eat the clive sausages i can't do I can't it eat clive. <laughs> one of my best friends is called clive that's just i just put oh, no. things in my head <laughs> anyway um right so we've got two left uh okay. you have to jog on on one and take a hike on the other so you could take a gamble on the next one if you really okay. like it but then the last one might be a dad right okay so oh, okay. the fourth topic is f- Funnily enough, we were talking about, I mean, it's it's a bit past medieval times, the Great Fire of London, but medieval history, number four. Oh, I know. I can see you're tempted. I'm tempted. I know really, really specific stuff about medieval history. I have got, I've got a bit of an interest in um, uh, funeral traditions and stuff. And there's quite Ooh. a few interesting ones in medieval history, but I think oh, I'm going to do. I'm going to take a massive gamble and gamble. say this one can take a hike, and I'll talk I need about a the sound next one. Bite. All right, oh, I God. need to get a sound bite with with all this kind of stuff, or a sound uh, clip to go the gambling. <laughs> um, right. So, okay, I've, I think you've made the right choice here. Actually, I mean, if you did talk about medieval history, we've just got Sutton Hoo, you know, not too far away from here, since I'm on the Norfolk Suffolk border and all that kind of stuff. And you're talking about oh, burials, nice. but um, right, yeah. okay, the last one actually, you probably have made a decent-ish choice because you do love your movies, and it is actually Disney movies. <gasps> okay, excellent. So, so we're jogging Disney on. movies. Yes, I'm definitely jogging. On. So. <laughs> Disney movies, weirdly, I listen to um, Disney movie soundtracks a lot, but actually not just in my my general day. Um, I listen to them uh, before I do events for work. So we have events at the minute using with our uh, online community, which is called Animal Academy for young people who are interested in working with animals in the future. And we do live events and beforehand so that we can check in a fun way whether their audio is connecting so they can hear us. Um, before I pop up, I have a Disney song playing. Um, and that way, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an okay song for young people to hear, first of all. I don't have to keep going through and making sure the lyrics are okay. Uh, but it's nice and upbeat and there's plenty of really cool ones that are associated with animals in some way. So obviously lots and lots of The Lion King comes up, A uh, Little Mermaid comes up quite a lot. And um, my current favourite, which is actually probably one who's getting up there with my favourite movies, which is an unusual place to be because my other favourite movies are like Terminator, Kill Bill, The Matrix, Moana. <laughs> Moana yes. is incredible. It made me do a little cry when I watched it first. I watched it with some kids at a summer school and I was there going, this is just really nice. Yeah. <laughs> and it's got Lin-Manuel Miranda doing the soundtrack. Yeah. It's just got some really incredible opportunities for young people to um, see something that where the main story isn't a love story, which I think is really important. Um, but also just the songs are fantastic and they yep. can learn about Polynesian culture, historical Polynesian culture as well in a way that doesn't feel like they're learning the same way that Mm. it's been tried to be worked in in the past um and when i was younger i'd like mulan was definitely one of my favorites because obviously like she's well cool yeah um but that mulan and pocahontas were some of my favorites but those also when i grew up i was like oh yeah particularly Pocahontas, uh, <laughs> but M- Moana feels like a lot of people had input to make sure that this was yeah. accurate and just a really good story. So mm. I I love Disney, yeah. And you can always tell um, if there's a group of like animal biologists, be like, oh, your favorite <laughs> Disney movie was either Tarzan or The Lion King. And they're like, how did you know? <laughs> so, oh, well, it's not that, it's not that hard. <laughs> no. Yeah, and what I also like about Moana is that there is actually some very, very good um, critiques, you know, good critiques, not just slagging off of Moana, saying, you know, this, they have got this part of the culture, right? There is this, but which is probably not so bad. And it actually does enable those conversations to take place as well. Yes. And, yeah. uh, and everything you've mentioned as well, because, um, you know, we were talking about uh, Studio Ghibli, for example, is that you're obviously like, like me, you enjoy movies with a very central, powerful, female lead 
or a female identifying character lead um and which is i mean i'm an intersectional feminist so that speaks right to to, to me so and moana is just a perfect example of like who doesn't take any crap from from uh, <laughs> from maui so yes. uh, but yeah but hey hey you, the hey hey the chicken is just like i love hey hey but yeah like, the-, the comedy of that oh it was just, it was so good because yeah, I um I saw it at the summer school and then immediately came back and was like, to my partner, I was like, so we have to watch Moana? And he was like, isn't that a kid's, it's a kid's film? And I was like, shh, shh, no. it's not a kid's film. It's a film for everyone, I think you'll find. <laughs> um, but it was quite sweet because he was kind of half watching, half, I think maybe playing video games or something. And then it, yeah, you know. Um, and then it came to the point where it's like, um. Uh, the where you are song and she's getting oh. like put in the headdress and stuff and he yeah. turns and he's like oh is it her like um her like coming of age or is she getting married i was like no no it's she's going to be the leader of the village in the future and so it's talking about this is your what your future is holding and he was like ah oh, that's quite cool and then carried on watching it um and go. he quite quite enjoyed <laughs> there you go Excellent. Well, that was fantastic. I'm glad we spared a bit of time to do that. Um, and and you're so thank you for being so generous for your time because because uh, you've been here a bit longer than than I I was planning. Um, which is <laughs> I'm completely right. okay with because I'm really enjoying this. So <laughs> I love um, talking. So you know. That's yeah. Well, so do I. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. We <laughs> everybody knows that I can talk. Crikey. Um. <laughs> so the last bit for us to do then is another another bit of fun is that we like to connect all our guests together uh, and just a really silly way of bringing the geography community together and to get out the fact that you can link everything to geography. Oh yeah, such a trope for geography teachers. Um. So. Last episode, we had the wonderful Joanna Mendez, um, who is senior researcher at the Met Office, and she was given a completely random word by the guest before, by Hina as a geography teacher. Discombobulated is what Hina just couldn't think of. So I just went, discombobulate, I'm going to go with that. And so, but Joanna did a fairly decent job with that, which is brilliant. Then I asked Joanna, what are you going to do for our next guest? I think Joanna's been a lot kinder for you. Um, All right. Less. So Joanna would like you to link the word language with geography geographical processes the world whatever so i think that's quite a nice one um yeah so uh we you have 30 seconds to simply talk to me about the geography of language if you like off you go language okay cool so i obviously not my wheelhouse but i'll try um so as far as i understand it language is pretty linked to geography generally because of the same way that speciation occurs when you have separation of um, of animals, they start to go across a geographical area. Maybe there'll be a barrier, say a mountain range, or maybe something like when the channel flooded. And those two um, animal populations start to change independent of one Ooh. each other. And Find so that. that's how... <gasps> what was that? 30, 30 seconds? seconds. No. Oh, no. Right, finish your thought. Finish your thought because it's right, intriguing. So... Go. Yeah, so that evolution is that, and there are speciation events that can occur for different reasons, but that was one of them, geographic separation, and then evolving to fill in those different niches in different ways. That is also how language evolves, and language can be, um, uh, is a kind of allegory, is a way that you can describe how evolution works, because both Spain, uh, Spanish and French come from Latin, but there was never a Latin speaking person who then gave birth to a Spanish speaking person. And I think okay. I've re- well heard put. that in an Eddie Izzard <laughs> thing. Yeah. But so to me, they're extraordinarily interlinked already. So that was a very kind one. <laughs> yeah. That does sound like something uh, she would come out with, Eddie Izzard would come out with. Um, yeah. Definitely. Right. Fantastic. Okay. Great. Yeah. And, and people have listened to the last episode. Actually, we kind of already did this a bit. We talked about how different cultures can have, different words for the same object the same thing like that there's um some wonderful people i should have looked up the name of their tribe i'm so so sorry between because i said i didn't remember last time as well i talked to these amazing people who are indigenous to the west coast of the united states and canada and they have and they the example they give for example is they have like 10 12 different words for tree because of how you know what a tree can do how it what it does with the environment, how they use the tree, the different stages of the tree's life, they had all these different words for it, and which is beautiful, whereas we just have tree, you know, in English. So, yeah, it, I'm hoping I'm going to have a guest from Malawi on and uh, and we can try and try out to see how rusty my chichaba is as well. So, yeah, oh, language wow. we can, we can. so I'm going to say Muli Bunji Lucy, which means, how, hi, how are you? Oh. So, uh, 
you say diddly exactly. widow which is i'm good so, well i i would try i'm probably gonna butcher but that's, <laughs> that's awesome that's really cool so listen so when i speak to uh this person you can you can have a go at that right your turn now to come up with a word for our following guest what are you going to give them to see if they can link to geography so uh, if this has already come up i have a i have a backup um but i'm going to go with art um which for me is something that i i do art i do um pet portraits and i'm currently learning how to use watercolors my god they're different Ooh. to colored pencils which is my <laughs> usual thing um they're quite, quite terrifying actually because it's very very free flowing and i'm not really used to that uh, but i love art and i'd really like to hear um people's perspective on that amazing yep art it is we haven't had that one yet um right okay so some shout outs then um perhaps give all oh, your your podcast your D podcast you can give that a shout out and anyone you want to give a shout out to fantastic so yeah quick fire um i am at punk biologist on everything so on twitter on instagram there's also a punk biology art which is where i do my art stuff and you can find my website www.punkbiologist.com um, and i am available to do chats podcasts uh speaking to young people speaking to not young people speaking about funny stuff speaking about serious stuff uh i do a lot of comedy things as well um <laughs> and then i also do another podcast so that is a DD podcast dungeons and dragons where i play a ginormous golden dragonborn who's a bit of an idiot uh, <laughs> and that is called live laugh lovecraft and so you can find us at live laugh lovecraft DD on twitter and on instagram and then finally, two things I'm involved with coming up that people might be interested in. Um, I am doing, it's not really a sponsored walk, but we're doing a walk uh, in memory of my friend's brother. Um, so we're walking Hadrian's Wall because he was particularly interested in history and also really loved Game of Thrones. So Hadrian's Wall being the original inspiration for The Wall, we're hoping to complete that in the middle of July and we're raising money for the campaign against living miserably, which is also called Calm, uh, which is a really excellent cause. So we're really pleased to be doing that. You can find links to that on my Twitter page. If you'd like to contribute, any amount is really, really um, welcomed. So thank you if you do. And the very last thing, I am working currently alongside a, a new app that has come out that's called Caper. So C-A-P-E-R. And the idea of that is to get uh, young people, children out into nature without uh, parents or guardians having to consider exactly what activity they'll be doing out there. So essentially, the young people get a video call from a character who may have crash landed their ship in the local mm -hmm. park and they need you to go and find five different types of leaf so they know whereabouts in the world they are. They need you to make them a shelter so they can stay in that overnight and they need you to go and find a worm or a bug or a bird. Nice. And so it's just an app that you can play with. It is free um, and it's really, really cool. And I'm going to be being the wildlife person on there soon. Uh, so you'll be able to see me on the app. <laughs> oh, Lucy, that sounds amazing. Oh my God, right. So now that is a reward for everyone who's stuck with this podcast and listened to it. Now, episode 11, you've just been generously rewarded with all this amazing stuff by Lucy there. Do check that all that stuff out. <laughs> Especially, I know one person who's going to be particularly happy and that's Mr. Mark Enser. He's quite he's quite well known in the geography teacher community because he loves a bit of D and D. So oh, yes. um, I will it's make a great sure community. that yeah, I will make sure that he knows about that podcast. Lucy, I have had so much fun, so much fun. Thank you so much for joining me and for giving up such such um, a lot of your time as well. And it's been an absolute pleasure to meet you. No worries. It's been really really lovely to meet you. And thank you very much for having me on. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you had fun. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe so more stories and experiences can drop into your favourite podcast app. If you fancy being a guest or have any feedback, follow us on Twitter at CoffeeJogPod and send us a DM. Or you could email coffeeandjog at geogramblings.com. Until next time, keep geogging. <laughs>